Up next on the 10 p.m. report, Sibley High students learn the fate of their vandalized school. Police investigate what may turn out to be the getaway car used by blind prison inmate escapee Larry Hill. In Dimension Opium, is it becoming the drug of choice in Minnesota's Hmong community? I'm Mike Walter, in for Don Shelby. I'm Cindy Hilger, in for Colleen Needles. The 10 p.m. report with Mike Fairborn and Tony Parker is next. Ditka. Hi, Brenner. What are you doing in Chicago? On the Balmoral Racetrack. Here are a couple passes for the owner's box. Hey, thanks. You fly Midway? Yeah, I got business in Cleveland, Columbus, Fort Lauderdale, New York, and I live in Tampa. It's a great little airline, Mike. Midway's not so little, George. You're wrong. Me? Wrong? Right, Mr. Steinbrenner, you're wrong. The Midway Shuttle has more flights to Chicago Midway Airport than any other airline. Wrong, huh? You're fired. I don't work for you. Oh, would you like to? The name of the game is the best shoe prices in town on the best brand names for every member of the family. The name of the store is Famous Footwear. The best shoes for the money. Period. At Plum Minnesota's four-day kitchen and bath sale, everything is on sale, including the kitchen sink. Four days only, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Save on everything for your kitchen. Like stock countertops, now on sale at Plywood, Minnesota. Save on all kitchens, like these Merillat cabinets, in stock and now up to 60% off. Get 90-day financing free or a 4% discount for cash. Four days of savings on everything for the kitchen and bath. Four days only, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. The four-day kitchen and bath sale at Plywood, Minnesota. Your, your super home store. store. Go 4 for 4 with Channel 4, the new home of the Minnesota Twins. You will have the best seat in the house when superstar Don Mattingly leads the Bronx Bombers into the Metrodome. Opening night, Tuesday, April 4th, exclusively on Channel 4, the Twins Station. Sibley High School in Mendota Heights. One week ago, it was the target of vicious vandals. Tonight, it was declared too dangerous for classes to resume until next fall at the earliest. WCCO Television presents Don Shelby, Colleen Needles, Mike Fairborn, and Mark Rosen. This is the 10 p.m. report. Good evening. The 1,200 students of Sibley High will not be allowed to return to their school. The damage done by vandals last week is just too great. Estimates now stand at more than $1 million. But it is the asbestos danger that will keep the doors to Sibley High shut tight. When the vandals turned on the sprinkler system, the water soaked the ceiling tiles that contain asbestos. That's a fire retardant and a cancer-causing material. Tonight, experts have concluded their study that shows as the asbestos dries, it will break apart. The small pieces will likely spread throughout the school through the ventilation system. That will pose a serious health threat. School officials still don't know how much time or money it will take to clean up the asbestos and the other damage done to the building. Earlier this week, police arrested and charged four young men with the vandalism. Three of them are Sibley students. All are out on bail this evening. And all four are the target of extreme anger from fellow students, parents, and school officials who met this evening to figure out what happens next. Reporter Mike Strand was at the meeting and joins us now from the newsroom. Mike? Sending more specifics tonight on the extent of damage. The worst of it occurred in the shop and arts departments, as well as the kitchen and the cafeteria. Officials say the science labs, music rooms, the auditorium, gym, and locker rooms were largely spared. Estimates for the cleanup could exceed $2 million now, we're told, but for students and their families, the problems will begin when spring break ends. Next week, this junior high school becomes the temporary home for some 1,200 Sibley students. The announcement came tonight as more than 600 parents and students listened to experts describe the mass destruction and the disruption of lives it will cause. Well, we may be able to clear certain sections and areas of the building, portions of the building, perhaps the entire building, may not or ought not be reoccupied for student use. Although it will be months before the school can be reopened, officials hope to provide limited access to staff by tomorrow and declare some sections of the school safe from asbestos within two weeks. And it's just all delay and it just ruins the whole year and just nothing's normal anymore, you know. Especially the new schedules, which district officials unveiled tonight. Beginning April 6, Sibley students will be in classes from 7 to 11 a.m. 
with classes running only 35 minutes. Students foresee discipline problems. There's a problem with attendance as it is getting there at 7.45, much less 7 o'clock, and plus with the lack of materials and the less time in school, it's, it's going to be a bit unorganized, I think. It's only a six-week time we're talking about, and I just think that that short day is going to be too short. I'm worried about my grades. I'm just worried how they're going to handle. It's, it's going to be a whole new school, really. As for the four vandals, their actions continue to pain and anger Sibley students. They're really irritated. This was their school, and it was trashed for no good reason whatsoever, for no reason at all. About the only bright spot at tonight's meeting came when district officials announced that graduation ceremonies will not be postponed. But the puzzling question that's yet to be resolved is just where they're going to hold it. Sidney and Mike. All right. Thanks very much, Mike. The Minneapolis School Board has approved a mini open enrollment plan that may send 600 students to new grade schools. It also means parents of 4,000 new kindergartners this fall must fill out choice cards selecting programs and schools they want for their kids. The board also decided students in the open and limited proficiency programs at Jefferson will shift to Wyndham School. Spanish immersion students at Wilder will move to Jefferson. And the proposed science, math, and technology learning center will go to Wilder. The House Education Committee has passed a bill that would put limits on the state's open enrollment program. It would prevent students from taking part in varsity athletics for one year after transferring to a new district. New developments tonight in the investigation into how inmate Larry Hill escaped from custody nearly two weeks ago. You'll recall that Stillwater prisoner Hill escaped during an eye exam in Minneapolis, later took hostages in Apple Valley, and then was killed by police to end a standoff. Former inmate Willie Johnson is charged with helping Hill escape and take hostages. The two wound up at the townhouse of Lois Platt, where they held her children at knife point and law officers at bay for more than 30 hours. Hill's widow, Darlene, offered to help the police during the standoff. They refused her assistance. Now we've learned that authorities are trying to determine whether Darlene Hill helped her husband escape. Caroline Lowe reports. This car belongs to Larry Hill's widow, Darlene, who lives in North Minneapolis. Several days ago, state investigators received a court-ordered search warrant to examine the car to see if it might have been involved in Larry Hill's getaway March 17th. Investigators still don't know how Hill and his alleged accomplice, Willie Johnson, were able to escape from a downtown Minneapolis medical office and wind up less than two hours later at Lois Platt's house in Apple Valley. Tonight, authorities refused to reveal if they found fingerprints or any other kind of evidence in Darlene Hill's car that would directly link it to her husband's getaway. But they do acknowledge it's the only car they have searched so far. We do know that one reason it was searched is because Lois Platt's neighbors told police and the media they saw a small blue car drop two men off at her house on March 17th and that a woman was with them. A black woman was in there, uh, tall and got out of her car. They kind of sat there for a few seconds. She got out of her car, opened her trunk. She got something out of the trunk. <clears throat> I couldn't see what it was. She had it like here. And then she walked into the car, sat down, and the other two men were still in there. One was in the back, one was in the front. They in an interview on the day her husband died, Darlene Hill acknowledged that he had told her of his plans to escape. He said if we could just be out, just if we could just share a day or two together, he would be happy. But in that same interview, Darlene Hill denied any involvement in his getaway. With Tom Lindner, Caroline Lowe, WCCO Television News in St. Paul. Tonight we tried to contact Darlene Hill, but she would not return our phone calls. An update tonight on the Northwest Airlines takeover speculation. The high-flying stock leveled off today, closing at 68 and a third, down two points from yesterday, as Northwest officials stayed mum about a possible takeover. The company has nothing to say about an investor group that may be interested in buying Northwest. One of those people rumored to be interested is Minneapolis-based corporate raider Erwin Jacobs. Junk bond king Michael Milken, who reportedly makes $200 million a year, today was indicted on federal racketeering and fraud charges that could result in a huge prison term and penalties exceeding $11 billion. The 98-count indictment is the largest since the insider trading scandal first surfaced with Wall Street's Ivan Boski. Milken, an investor with the firm of Drexel Burnham Lambert, is one of the most dynamic financiers of the decade. Milken's brother and another associate were also named in today's indictment. Federal officials announced today the breakup of a billion-dollar international money laundering operation. Federal agents displayed cash and cocaine seized in the sting. 
The operation laundered illegal drug profits of a Colombian cartel. I think it's fair to describe this uh, operation as a very hostile takeover of a major money laundering operation. The scheme sent millions of dollars from drug sales to two wholesale jewelry companies in Los Angeles. The money was deposited in 16 American banks as jewelry profits. It was then sent to a bank in Panama run by the drug cartel. 127 people have been arrested so far, but even with this sting, officials say the drug dealers have enough money to set up another money laundering operation sometime soon. Spreading oil from the nation's worst spill cover is 500 square miles tonight off the Alaskan port of Valdez. It has now seeped its way into the wilderness, disturbing the balance of nature. A sea otter, for example, struggles to find clean water. Reports tonight indicate the captain of the ship had been drinking, but he isn't take, talking under advice of his attorneys. Right now, workers are trying to protect salmon hatcheries from the oil, but some experts say it may be too late. This is the sound which awoke residents of Andover this morning. A large shredder chewed up the remains from February's tire fire as the state began cleaning up the area. The cost of the cleanup could run as high as several million dollars. However, officials are hopeful they'll be able to sell the tire remains to a local paper company to help offset the costs. Tonight, a Minneapolis bus driver is a half million dollars richer after she hit one of the richest bingo jackpots ever. 51-year-old Joan Wade hit the jackpot playing Mega Bingo in Shakopee last night. She's the mother of four. She I plans to buy a new home and pay some bills with her newfound fortune. She'll be paid $25,000 a year for the next 20 years. And tomorrow, she flies to Tulsa, Oklahoma to pick up the first check. Hmm. What a thrill. Well, look at now what's ahead here on the Wednesday 10 p.m. report. After whether grocery store packaging becomes a debate in Minneapolis, should plastics be eliminated? And if so, what will it cost you at the checkout line? Stay tuned as well for some big news out of the White House. Some dog days for the Bush presidency. And next in our Dimension segment, the opium addiction. How has it made its way to the Twin Cities? Behind the car, you'll find a special kind of care. At Blue Cross Blue Shield, caring keeps us a step ahead of a changing world. This plan has the flexibility people want. The research and is tied to the heart rate. You may not always see the care behind the card, but you can't miss the feeling it brings. Red Baron Pizza, microwave singles, an unexpected pleasure. Let's play tag. It's white tag days at your Mazda dealer. Get $750 cash back on Mazda trucks. Tag to sell fast. Mazda, rated number one in customer satisfaction for three straight years. With a number one warranty in the truck business. Mazda trucks, tag for $750 cash back from Mazda. See your Mazda dealer in Richfield, Brooklyn Center, White Fair, St. Paul, and Minnetonka. Tonight in Dimension, a drug addiction that is striking hard at this community's Southeast Asians. The drug, opium, which is grown in their native lands. The number of people addicted, three to five hundred locally. A high percentage are Hmong. Before going into our report on the problem, we want to add some perspective to it. Opium addicts are typically not pleasure-seeking, as is the case with cocaine addicts, for example. 
Opium has historically been used as a medicine. And many of today's addicts get hooked while using it as a self-medication for injuries and even for depression. There's been little reporting on this problem, in part because people in the Southeast Asian community are afraid to talk about it. One person told us he has received death threats for trying to address opium addictions. Nonetheless, it has drawn attention from doctors who want to treat addicts and authorities who want to keep opium from getting here. Our story begins with footage from the WCCO Moore Reports visit to Southeast Asia back in 1981. The opium is a cash crop in Southeast Asia, bought, sold, and traded by small armies rivaling the Colombian cocaine cartels. Poppies grown in these mountains yield the powerful drug that has been grown by farmers for centuries. The black oily gum is smoked and sometimes eaten. In a land without modern medicine, opium is folk medicine. They will take a, an opiate to relieve pain, to relieve headaches, gastrointestinal symptoms, and uh, pain from war injuries. And it's also highly addictive. Experts say 20% of the people in some villages are opium addicts. And as many emigrated to the United States over the past decade, their habit came with them. But to say opium addiction is condoned by the Southeast Asian community is like saying crack use is approved here. Opium addictions have fueled a new drug trade. One authority say is lucrative and violent. Uh, we know of at least one murder uh, within the Hmong community that has to do with uh, opium uh, supply issues. And so lives uh, have been threatened. Dr. Joseph Westermeyer is credited with developing a drug treatment program that has helped more than 100 opium addicts locally. He studied opium addiction in Southeast Asia for two decades and has followed the trail of opium to this country. And it's grown right here in the Twin Cities. I've seen Hmong backyards with poppy being grown right here in uh, the Twin Cities. One recent case, Shang Yer Kang, imported opium to his home in St. Paul. He pleaded guilty to federal drug charges and will be sentenced next month. Since 1983, U.S. Customs, uh, Agent Hendry's group, has intercepted 18 packages addressed to Mr. Kang. This case unraveled in the mails, the most common form of smuggling. Tons have been seized in recent years, but only until recently has the government begun cracking down. St. Paul police and customs agents delivered the opium sent to Kang and then arrested him. In his home, they found this small opium den, numerous pipes, money, 10 pounds of opium, and guns. They also found letters, letters from refugee camps in Thailand, asking Kang to sell the opium and send the money back to help his family. You must send $1,000. Don't cheat. I know where to find your son-in-law, Li Zeng. Think carefully. Now, you can't tell me that's wholesome. With those letters as evidence, a grand jury indicted the alleged accomplices in the refugee camp. It will prevent them from ever coming to the United States. He's going to forfeit his right because he's an importer of opium. We're also going to seek through the State Department to send this indictment to the Thai government so they can go into the camps and, frankly, raise hell with the people who ship opium. It is a tougher local policy that will be felt halfway around the world, but one authority's hope will sever a devastating tie between refugees and their homeland. The three to five hundred people addicted here represent about four percent of the Southeast Asian population, a far lower percentage than the rate of alcoholism in this country. The university's opium treatment program has had a high rate of recovery mainly due to intense pressure on addicts from their families. It's spring! Time to freshen up rooms and save at Menards! Save 50% right now on pre-pasted wallpaper. Choose from over 200 patterns in stock. On sale now at half price. And change rooms with carpeting by Diamond Mills. The attached cushion makes installation easy. Save on the thick sculptured Monaco, now just $7.98 per square yard. Bruce up for spring and save at Menard. We're helping you build America's heartland at Menards. 
Growing soybeans is a real tug of war between you and weeds. You can try to stand your ground with pre-emergence herbicides, but they can let weeds escape, and you can end up back where you started. But with the post-emergence herbicides from BASF, you can hold the line against weeds and do the job right, right from the start. When BASF goes over, it's over. If you're talking about it... It was fascinating, really. It's on Donahue. TV's hunkiest housekeeper on the hit sitcom Who's the Boss? I speak of Tony Dent. He's gone from the boxing ring to the TV screen. Meet him as he steps out of character to talk about what's important to him, his family, his hit show, and his future. Tony Danza is my guest on the next Donahue. Thursday at 8 on Channel 4. Go 4 for 4 with Channel 4, the new home of the Minnesota Twins. You will have the best seat in the house when superstar Don Mattingly leads the Bronx Bombers into the Metrodome. Opening night, Tuesday, April 4th, exclusively on Channel 4, the Twins Station. Levitt Spring Spectacular has the greatest furniture bargains you've ever seen, anywhere. Store-wide savings on hundreds of items, now at the Levitt's near you. It's Oscar night in Hollywood, the night the stars come out for the glitz and glamour of the 61st Academy Awards. And so far, the awards go to Best Supporting Actor Kevin Kline in A Fish Called Wanda. And for Best Supporting Actress, Gina Davis has won. She appeared in The Accidental Tourist. Two surprises so far. They, they both are surprising. Wiener, Weeper. Yeah would win that one. Right. But you picked one of those, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and the uh, weather's been full of surprises, too. Oh, yeah. Hasn't it, though? <laughs> up north, as much as five inches of snow up around the Park Rapids area. Oh, yes. My. And uh, the northern part of the state is still not fit for man or beast, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite a bit of slippery road conditions up to the north. But uh, mm -hmm. I think that uh, those conditions will improve fairly fast because mm -hmm. we're expecting some rather mild air to come in there in the next couple of days. And we just ended up with showers yeah, here in the south. Bad. That's right. Marilyn Johnson uh, caught this uh, video for us. And, uh, very, very pretty out there tonight. Our high temperature today was 48 degrees after an overnight low of 37 and three hundredths of an inch of precipitation uh, fell at the National Weather Service from all of the shower activity that we had around the area today. Uh, it did slip up the roads for a little bit. Didn't do much in washing off the grime and the grit, though, did it? I guess we'll have to wait for one of those nice, heavy summer thunderstorms to do that. In the meantime, temperatures up to the north are still below freezing. Uh, up around International Falls, still snowing heavily there an hour ago. They're at 24 degrees. Here in the southern part of the state, temperatures holding in the 40s and the 30s. We'll probably drop off into the 30s tonight. What we really need now, we talked to the Arboretum earlier today out at the Landscape Arboretum. They need some nice cool nights down to around freezing and some nice warm sunny days to get the maple sap flowing. And so far it just isn't doing much. So we've got to work on that. Here's the clouds that were approaching us early this morning. They moved on through us, producing the showers that we had. And the northern part of the state stayed in the clouds almost all day long. And as that was drifting through them, that's when it was laying down anywhere between three and five inches of snow across the northern third of Minnesota. So road conditions up in this part of the state are uh, still fairly treacherous tonight. They will, though, slowly improve. Here's what caused it all, the low pressure area. There's the snow associated with it. It's going to move out fairly fast. Low pressure's Further to the south, they're going to continue to allow Gulf moisture to come up for showers and thunderstorms. They had a bout of severe weather again today down in parts of Texas and over into Louisiana. We may see some sunshine here tomorrow afternoon, but it's going to be a little bit cooler because the air behind that uh, front is colder. Another weather system out on the west coast will probably bring us a chance of some showers again here toward the end of the weekend. Our high temperatures in the meantime, 30s up to the north, 40s here in the south. So as we warm up into the 30s tomorrow, much of that snow will begin to, to slowly melt off. Cloudy skies out there right now. We're at 43 degrees, humidity 82%. West winds at 16, a dew point of 38, and the barometer is 29.91, and it's rising. Mostly cloudy. We still could have a sprinkle or two out there, but nothing really intense tonight. A low temperature of 33 degrees, northwest winds at 10 to 20. We had talked about the possibility of that changing over to snow overnight. Well, that's not going to happen now. So turning partly sunny tomorrow after a cloudy start, 43 degrees for a high, northwest winds 10 to 20 miles an hour. Mostly clear tomorrow night with a low of 25 and for Friday mostly sunny but still having a hard time recovering from this uh, little snap of cool air we've had 40 degrees Saturday some showers a little warmer air out ahead of that next system 51 degrees and then dropping back into the 40s for Sunday and Monday sounds like we're back to normal aren't we pretty close to normal yeah temperature